All right, everyone, we are live. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the regular board meeting for Wednesday, January 25th, 2023. Before we begin, I'd like to recognize that this meeting is taking place on the traditional unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, and I know we're all grateful to be here today. Most of us. With that, we will get underway. We do have some changes to the addition, uh, changes to the additions, to the agenda this afternoon. Uh, items forwarded from our earlier meeting. Um, item SR2 is a report regarding Chimneyus River floodplain mapping, and we've added the additional letter of support from Hull Out First Nation. And under unfinished business, we have AVICC resolutions. And with those changes to the agenda, I'd ask for a motion to adopt as amended. Moved by Director Morrison, seconded by Director Staples. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed? Motion carries. Great start. We're moving right along. Our next item, um, I guess I usually turn this over to you. I'm sorry, I had counsel last night, so I used to read all this stuff all myself. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Agenda item two, adoption of minutes. Uh, first uh, the and only is the regular board meeting of December 14th and the recommendation that the minutes of the regular board meeting of December 14th, 2022 be adopted. If there are no errors or omissions, moved by Director McGonigal, seconded by Director Abbott. All those in favor? Any opposed, none opposed, motion carries. Mr. Robbins. There is no business arising from those minutes. Moves you to public input period. Good afternoon, we do have 15 minutes for public input. Go ahead, you can make your way up, Cliff. <laughs> Also known as uh, the introductory comments today for public input are brought to you by Mr. Evans. Mr. Evans, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, on uh, the last, uh, on today's agenda is um, EASC um, meeting uh, CR3.9 uh, uh, rezoning to, uh, from four lots to one lot up at um, the Erie place. And they want to rezone from one lot to, or from, from four lots to a one lot commercial tourism. And at the ESC meeting, I asked um, what the water consumption increase would be with all the tourists going in there because they don't have enough water. And I think that uh, that we should have the answer to that before this is passed. They don't even have enough water to do their laundry. They have to send their laundry out. They don't have enough water for firefighting. And yet this is on the board to go through today. Mr. Chair, I would like to see this go back to, to the APC committee and they have a look at it and, and get some um, better information on how much the water increase will be for that. Also on um, on 232 or, or on the ICF we have reserved money of I think close to 500,000 We've held that for years and years and years. It would be interesting to see what's, what's happening to that. Um, a lot of people around Shawnigan Lake uh, would like to see uh, Function 232, that's Shawnigan Parks, uh, looked at look, uh, to see if there's any plans, <coughs> alternative plans that the board is making in case the uh, ICF doesn't come up with the money to run the railway. Also, Mr. Chair, the Basin Society would also like to see some discussion on function 488 and some consideration on giving the Shawnigan Lake Basin Society some funding because we're really hurting right now. We've had uh, gener uh, a uh, very generous donation uh, given last month. But this is tough trying to pick up beer cans and uh, run the Shawnigan Basin Society. 
So I wonder if those things could be done at today's meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Appreciate your input as always. Anyone else for public input today? Is there any online for public input, Mr. Robbins? There is not, Mr. Chair. Seeing no one stepping to the microphone for public input, then we will move on with our agenda. I believe, Ms. Robbins, that takes us to delegations. Correct. Your first delegation is uh, Kim Stevens, Partnership for Water Sustainability in British Columbia. This is regards to the release of the first set of five comprehensive regional stories and to present the Watershed Moments Award. Right. Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you. And uh, just waiting for my PowerPoint presentation to come up. <laughs> just take a moment. I can see the screen moving <laughs> right. feverishly. So. But in the meantime, I, I, I will, yes, thank, thank, thank you. We appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And on behalf of my colleague, Paul Chapman, it will be a co-presentation. And, you know, it, it really is kind of nice to be in a room with people, not on a Zoom call. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, but more than that, for me, I have been making presentations in this room to boards beginning in 2006. So of the various boards around the region, about around, around the state of sea, this is my favorite because it's the one boardroom where you can, as, as a speaker standing here, you can actually feel that you're connected to your audience, not like with Metro Vancouver, CRD, or Nanaimo, or Comox Valley. So it's, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak here. Um, to set the, the tone, for, uh, this statement really sets the tone for today's uh, presentation, co-presentation by Paul and myself. And, I just want to read it to you in terms of by pulling threads of understanding from the past through to the present and future, it would help communities achieve the vision for reconnecting people, fish, land, and water in altered landscapes. Just want you to reflect on that for a moment. I guess I can handle this now. Mr. Chair, um, given that we have three topics in one, I would appreciate it if, if the board would uh, grant us an extra five minutes to cover what we need to cover today. Thank you. I'll turn to our board colleagues, moved by Director Nicholson, seconded by Director Morrison. All those in favor? None opposed. Motion carries. You're a well-heeled speaker already, sir. <laughs> we, we appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, so obviously the, the first thing, the primary thing, is to announce release of your story. That's what I call it. It's the Cowichan story. I'll talk more in a moment. Um, but we're also here, and that's why Paul's here as the chair of the Watershed Moments Symposia series to present uh, the inaugural award to Kate. Now, we know that Kate had a medical appointment in Victoria from 12 to 1, and she said she was going to try me here at time. So she's, behind. she's here. <laughs> Can we have an extra five minutes beyond the five minutes now? <laughs> well, I tell you what, get through the presentation, and we probably won't count those minutes. Oh, okay, then, right. So that's number two, right? Uh, and uh, thirdly, we're going to ask you to, uh, if you would please all attend the February 23rd seminar that we're organizing, and Paul will talk to that. I said the tone was that previous quote. This is the context. The context is the Georgia Basin Interregional Educational Initiative, which uh, the partnership leads. And really, in, in a word, it's collaboration. So when you think of especially this region, you know, and, and what floods and droughts mean to you, right? And where we can actually make a difference is at the, at the local scale. And so in terms of collaboration to um, be more efficient and effective in what we do, really it comes down to this, this cascading logic. You know, if you think in terms of your guiding philosophy is to design with nature and you implement green infrastructure and ultimately you restore the water balance, that's how you adapt to a changing climate. So that's kind of a big picture, right? But I'm not here to dwell on that. What I really want to talk initially about for the next few minutes is the story behind the story. And, you know, in terms of thinking about how I could encapsulate this into a couple of bullets, it really is know your history, understand the context, and your story, the Couchin story, it really goes back to the 90s in terms of what we tell in the story here. And it's really about building on experience and celebrating the journey because the one thing you learn in local government is that it is a journey, right? It takes takes multiple terms to make things happen. And the final thought is accept the baton because in that 30-year context, that three-decade context, there's been a series of boards who've handed the baton, right, that got us to where we are today. And the second message being, you know, staff can only carry things so far. So only when someone who is elected takes the lead and is the champion does something happen. 
and that's been on my observation over the multiple decades now in terms of the couch and region has had strong chairs who've really believed and been passionate about things. So that makes a difference. And also with this being the beginning of a fresh term, a fresh board, there's always this window of opportunity, especially post COVID, right? When you can last be in person. So it's that opportunity to rekindle energy that, you know, this, this board, this region has had for decades. So in terms of this document, it's about the people and my role as the editor, the author and the interviewer, because it was all about conversational interviews with people who'd be part of the story, is to provide this regional district, this region with what I call as a legacy resource. So it is not a technical report. And it's not even format, formatted as a technical report. So even though it's a thick document, lots of white space, lots of pictures, uh, but it's all about the quotable quotes that I've weaved into a storyline. And I do hope that you will all download it and print it, because if you print it, you can flip the pages, right? And if you flip the pages, you can find what catches your attention. And if you do that, I sure hope you'll find that it's enjoyable, informative, and compelling. So next Tuesday's e-blast will be when we actually release this via water bucket news to a provincial audience. And the couch and story, you're the first, because uh, what I'm in the process of doing then is the, is the comprehensive, the series of comprehensive stories really about interregional collaboration. And so Comox Valley is next, after it'll be Metro Vancouver. So it's really being able to reflect on the last 20 to 30 years through the eyes, through the, you know, the, the eyes of those who've been part of the story, but not just looking back, it's seeing ahead. And so that's an important part of the, of the story is to, with what we know today, how do we see moving ahead? So that's in it. You can see on the left-hand side, basically the structure, you know, the, from the interregional context. Part B is really looking at the three parts that follow CD and E and putting it all in context, but then leading the reader <coughs> through the last, well, since 2006, when we kicked off Convening for Action. So where is this all going? So, you know, when you, if you fly across the, Georgia, you know, the Salish Seas, you realize it's just a big puddle, right, relatively speaking. And what we call the various regions, they're just valleys leading into this one little lake. And so um, our language is we're flowing towards water reconciliation. So if you look at that, that, that image, you don't have to look at the words, but you know, each of, those, each of those streams is feeding into the big stream. You know, and the partnership story, we have our own story, which is in parallel with the Calton story, the Nanaimo story, the Metro Vancouver regional story. And why are we convening for action? And the why, what, how? Well, we are all experiencing how the seasonal water cycle is changing. So just to give you an example, and as I reflect on my career as a professional engineer, when I graduated when, in doing water resource studies, we thought in terms of three month droughts. That was our worst case scenario. And now, and now one has to think in terms of six months. So if you think about the fact in the span of my professional career, it's doubled from, from, from three months to six months and we've always depended on seasonal storage. So it kind of puts it in context. You don't need fancy math, right? <laughs> you, just, you just need to understand that we need twice as much water in storage to get us through. So what is the goal of the interregional inter education initiative? Well. It's kind of plain, in plain language, language. Get it right in the stream channels and get it right on the land, dra draining to, this, to, the, to them. And we had that brief conversation for a few seconds beforehand. It's all about understanding that water is a system, right? Groundwater is connected to surface water. Not, they're not, it's not like this big, this big lake to be in mind down there. So in terms of collaboration, how do we get there? It's through sharing and learning from each other to ensure that where each region is going is indeed the right way. That's what has guided the IREI for the past, well, since 2012. So my final slide for this part of this presentation. So the Georgia Basin Interregional Education Initiative is a unique mechanism for collaboration, for interregional collaboration. So back in 2012, it was a bold leap forward. You know, I went to all the five boards on behalf of the partnership and ask for their support, including this Couchin. We always kick off with Couchin for some reason. And so, you know, in 2016, uh, there was that five-year commitment, now it's 2023. So this year, with the rollout 
of each of these stories. It's going back to each of you and asking you to recommit to the IREI through 2026 to your term of office because everybody benefits from collaboration. So it's, it's an easy endorsement. Now I'm going to hand off to Paul. Hi, I'm uh, Paul Chapman. I'm the chair of the, uh, the Watershed Moments uh, Symposia Series. And in my day job, I'm the executive director of the Nanaimo and Area Land Trust. And if you're wondering what Nanaimo is doing here, um, we hold uh, covenants on three properties in the CVRD, including one that you guys own on the Coke Sila. And it's uh, just an, another example of the sort of um, cross-boundary collaboration that is part of what we'll be uh, celebrating today. So I'm here to talk to you about the Watershed Moments Award in honor of Rob Lawrence. Um, I, Rob grew up in, in this valley and began his stewardship journey here as executive director of the Couch and Land Trust. And he moved from that position to a, a, a position with the city of Nanaimo as environmental planner. And in his time in that position, he, uh, he grew the responsibilities to include community collaboration. He played a key role in almost uh, every major waterway stewardship initiative in the Nanaimo area. And his, his strength was connecting community stewardship passion with uh, municipal capacity and, and building from there. Beyond the um, city of Nanaimo, Rob was a foundational member of the Watershed Moments team, uh, working together to present the symposiums that, uh, and seminars that uh, we'll I'll talk about a bit later. And uh, Rob retired from the city of Nanaimo in 2020. He moved to Bellingham, and unfortunately, he passed away in 2022. As part of the stewardship community uh, in the Nanaimo area, I can attest that Rob is missed for his contributions of effective stewardship partnerships and his personable ways. Uh, so the, the, the inaugural award is going to Kate Miller. And I think um, Kate is, an inaugural, uh, is, a, is a worthy recipient of this award. Uh, Kate connects the dots between community and regional government water stewardship collaboration. Uh, Kate also leads inter-regional collaboration on, on water stewardship initiatives through her participation on the Watershed Moments team. And beyond these accomplishments, uh, Kate and Rob worked together in water stewardship efforts in the Cowichan region in their previous working lives. Kate is an outstanding uh, asset to her community and the community of water stewardship practice. And through collaboration and sharing of experience is growing a culture of water stewardship in the CVRD and across Vancouver Island and through the series of symposia and seminars beyond that as well. So it's, it's a real pleasure to present the award to Kate. So the Watershed Moments team continues to carry Rob's work forward, and we work um, at presenting seminars and ultimately a symposium on blue ecology, which is the interweaving of Indigenous and Western water stewardship knowledge. And this is a, a pathway to water reconciliation. Uh, over the last few years, we've all learned to pivot. And uh, Blue Ecology offers us a chance to pivot towards a place of collaboration and hope as the, uh, the founder of the Blue Ecology Symp uh, Symposium um, Institute refers to it, Michael Blackstock, he refers to it as the hope spectrum. We're moving to the hope spectrum. 
We are seeking, we are working towards holding a symposium in the CVRD to explore how blue ecology applies here. But we are working to build those relationships that we need to do to bring this to fruition. And uh, we're not going to rush this process. We want to make sure we do it right. Uh, so in the interim, we're producing online seminars. We had one last year on some aspects of the blue ecology um, methodology. And also uh, this year, we're, um, we're doing another in the series of blue ecology um, seminars. And this one is titled, uh, a pathway to water reconciliation and resilience for mayors, councillors, and regional directors in British Columbia. So it's you know it's very appropriate to this room. Registration's now open, February 23rd at 7 p.m. Uh, you know, be there, be square. Um, so yes, yeah, so thank you, and, and thank you for considering uh, attending that. And it's um, beyond beyond elected officials. It's also going to be an important piece for stewardship, uh, the, the stewardship community that I represent as well. And I will hand it back to Kim. Thank you, Paul. For the finale slide. So we're on, on schedule. <laughs> Daniel Pauly, Dr. Daniel Pauly, UBC, is legendary and, uh, you know, has a global reputation. And he's at UBC. And the reason we wanted to conclude today with this is because, uh, and I'll get to the, his quotable quote in a moment, he coined the phrase shifting baseline basically to explain how it is that we allow things to degrade incrementally. And what's really interesting in terms of the couch and valley connection, and I only learned this uh, last year, was that um, when UBC enticed him to come to UBC in the 90s, his first grad student at UBC is Dr. Dave Preakshot at the municipality of North Couch. And so I think that's a rather interesting connection that, uh, you know, there's this to Daniel Pauly. But, I just want to read the quote to you because it's something to think about when you're making decisions about what you can do at the local scale and you know, address the global problems, which are overwhelming, but at a local scale you can. So he, has, he says, we transform the world, but we don't remember it. We adjust our baseline to the new level, and we don't recall what was there because it's what you see now that you think was always been there. And you can have a succession of changes, and at the end you want to sustain miserable leftovers. That's really how he framed it, right? trying to sustain miserable leftovers. And the question is, why do people accept this? Well, because they don't know that it was different. But Daniel Pauly, and this is my final thought or statement really, is that he also said, once you recognize that there is a shifting baseline, it is possible to bend the curve. And that's what we're all about in the terms of the partnership and NALT and the, the Watershed Moments team. You can bend the curve, right? You can bend it upwards. But it takes time. If it took us 100 years to trash the environment, it'll take us 100 years to fix things up. But at least we know what we should be doing, and it starts at the site scale. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, thank you very much. Uh, don't go too far. You may have questions or comments from uh, my, our colleagues around the board. Um, I just want to say well ahead of schedule, so good on you. Um, <laughs> and thank you so much for the entertaining and informative um, presentation. And uh, to our very own Ms. Miller, thank you for your work that led to your award today, and you're a very deserving recipient. Um, I've had the opportunity to sort of be on the sidelines of Kate's work for a number of years now, and, and I know we're all very thankful for her presence within our organization and within the greater watershed and water stewardship community. Um, but also very grateful to you and your organization and the partnerships that you maintain. Um, I'm an avid reader of your newsletter. Um, so <laughs> I, every time I, I saw you on the agenda, I'm like, there's the email. So I'll really look forward to next week's email. <laughs> Um, to, to read something uh, that's really close to home. But uh, just want to turn it over to the board for any questions or, or comments. Um, and I just want to say on behalf of myself and our entire region, thank you for your work. Thank um, you. And for doing things like this, those watershed moments, moments lift up um, not just the stewardship community, but uh, the leadership in, uh, around tables like these. So um, you're very effective at it. So please keep doing it because the more people you bring into the conversation, the better off we'll all be. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and you did such a good job. I'm not seeing any hands for questions or comments. So we'll continue to engage. And, and uh, I don't want to say we're going to commit to re-up our commitment, but... Uh, There's I no financial involvement. I, it's just I, a I was about to say, but with the ultra-low cost that you're... Uh, the involvement 
uh, costs, I'm sure we can find a path forward. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I'll go back to you, Mr. Robbins, for our next delegation. Uh, your next delegation includes uh, Sean Haley from the Ministry of Transportation. Uh, this is in regards to ministry projects, planning, priorities, maintenance, and other ministry-related things. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. And uh, I just want to say uh, thank you for having Ministry of Transportation here today. Uh, I was supposed to be here with uh, Michael Pearson, the director for Vancouver Island, but he sends his regrets. He's unable to come. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people as well. Um, and again, thank you for, ha for having us. Uh, the presentation that we've put together uh, for, for everyone here today is, the, I guess the purpose is to tr sort of introduce myself, introduce my colleagues, and put a face to the name. I've, I've been emailing a lot of you, uh, but I haven't met many of you in person, and I know that uh, this is a new board, so congratula congratulations to the new members that are here today. Uh, so let's, uh, let's get right into it. Uh, again, I'll, maybe I'll start with just telling you guys a little bit about myself. So I have been with Ministry of Transportation since uh, 2014. Uh, I was an area manager in our, our uh, CRD area prior to taking on the operations manager role that I'm currently in. Uh, so I just ended up, I started in the Caribou uh, where I was for a year. Uh, I am from, born and raised on the island, so I really wanted to get back here. Uh, so just after a year, I managed to transfer back and, uh, and I've been loving it. So now that I'm the operations manager, my, my area of responsibility is essentially Shimana South. Uh, including the, Gulf, the Southern Gulf Islands. Uh, and then my counterpart here. Hi, my name is Nikki Schneider and I'm the operations manager for uh, Central Vancouver Island. So I do have a little piece of the CVRD um, under my belt. Um, much like so Sean grew up in the ministry but in the development services department. Um, and I've been the operations manager for just short of a year so far, but previous to this was a provincial approving officer. So. Uh, and had that entire island purview under my belt, so very familiar with uh, the roads and the land use and, and a lot of the regional district staff. We also uh, dragged our other colleague. Uh, this is Keisha Disher, so she's our, our new provincial approving officer. Uh, just in case when we get to the end of the presentation, if you do have any questions, we just wanted to make sure we've got some somebody here that can speak to those things. So. <laughs> it's lovely to meet you all. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, so we'll get right into it. Uh, so again, yeah, the purpose is to, to, to make an introduction with each of you today, uh, to, to give you, uh, you, I'm sure you've all already looked at the presentation, it was submitted, but uh, some of our key contacts are gonna be on here. Uh, I'd also like to talk sort of about our organizational structure a little bit. I know that it's, Every time I meet somebody from, from uh, outside of Ministry of Transportation, they don't really know what our structure looks like. It is quite complicated. Uh, so we're gonna talk just kind of a little bit about that. Uh, we're gonna go through some of our accomplishments that we made through 2021 and 2022, mostly in my area. So we call my area Service Area 1. I'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about some of our planning priorities for 2023. And then again, yeah, if we have time afterwards, we'll go to questions. Sorry if, if this is too much information. Uh, I know that it is quite dry because it's going to be like just facts just coming at you. So hopefully your eyes don't glaze over. Uh, so here we are with our introductions. Uh, Mike Pearson again, uh, he was meant to be here, but uh, he sends his regrets. Uh, he's our director. Uh, he previously was our, our district manager for Vancouver Island. Uh, and he went over to be the director of engineering and geomatics. Uh, we really wanted him to come back, so we gave him a fancy title, and here he is. <laughs> so now he's the director of Vancouver Island. Uh, we have an associate uh, district manager. Her name's Amanda Price. Uh, so that's, as you can see next. Uh, she's, she's been with us for less than a month, so many of you probably won't have heard that name quite yet, but you will. Uh, and then there's me, of course, so I am the operations manager, again, for Service Area 1, so that's Southern Vancouver Island. Uh, Nikki Schneider is the operations manager for Central Island, so she basically takes over at Mount Sicker. That's where our border is, so she looks after Mount Sicker North, and I'm Mount Sicker South. Uh, and then, yes, Keisha Disher as well. 
Okay, so again, so this is the province. So this is, we're the Ministry of Transportation. So we are a provincial entity. Uh, we do have several districts in, in our uh, in our province. We have several regional areas as well. Um, this here, you see this is Vancouver Island District. Uh, so I, do you know how many regions there are? We have three regions. Three regions in the province. So within those regions, there's districts. Uh, our region is South Coast region, so that includes Lower Mainland and Vancouver Island. Uh, and then we have Vancouver Island, our own district, that's divided into three service areas. So essentially, yeah, there's the district level. We're the ones that interface with the public the most at the district level. And then the regional level, that's where a lot of our executives are, our engineers are, although we do have engineers at the district level as well. And then, of course, then there's the uh, capital level. Our capital uh, headquarters is in Victoria. Uh, that's where you know the ADMs go for their for their big meetings and, and all that kind of stuff. So, so yes, this is uh, my service area. This is service area one, uh, as you can see here. These are the Gulf Islands that I have. The contract value that we have. So, our maintenance contractor in service area one is MCON Services. Uh, you've probably seen their yellow trucks driving around. Uh, our contract value with them is fifteen million dollars a year. Uh, we have them for 10 years in total, and we're roughly, I, we're in year four. Uh, we're a couple months into year four. Our, the contract renewal date is October, uh, so a few months into to year four. Um, we also deliver other things outside of our $15 million a year that's delivered in our contract. We also uh, deliver what's called H200. It's another way of procuring, uh, if, in, if an emergency happens or something like that, they obviously need to respond to that emergency outside of contract funds. Uh, so we do, after DFAA, which is our atmospheric river event that happened in 2021, uh, MCON's been extremely busy uh, attending to, we had over 110 sites actually just in my service area alone. And that's on top of what we deliver on an annual basis. So they were quite busy. So again, with some contacts here, uh, TMCBC, that's Transportation Management Center BC. They're kind of like our comm center. Uh, they've got this giant room in Coquitlam. It's full of computer screens and they keep an eye on all of the Drive BC cams. Uh, every time we have an MVI or a closure or some kind of environmental uh, disaster or something like that, they're every, it's all hands on deck and they're putting that messaging out on Drive BC as well as our Tran BC blog. Um, so, that's just going on Drive BC. We like to tell everybody to check Drive BC before you go on any kind of trip. Um, we also, so I have area managers that work under me. I have four area managers. I have three road area managers and one bridge area manager. Uh, so for you, for, for your sake, uh, Francois Laurent, he's my uh, area manager for the Malahat, essentially. Pardon me. Uh, I don't know it, how many people knew Tina Rogers uh, prior, but he essentially has taken over for, from Tina Rogers. Uh, so he looks after uh, essentially right at Langford at West Shore Parkway and going right up to uh, uh, South Shawnigan Lake Road. Uh, and then, so half of the Malhat and then the other half of the Malhat would be Ryan Giroux, who's here. Um, so he's got Highway 18, Ryan Giroux's got uh, obviously Lake Couch and Yubo, Honeymoon Bay area. Um, so those are your main contacts that you're gonna have from my area. Uh, again, the, the <coughs> maintenance contractor is MCON. So we have their 24 hour hotline. I've, I have heard that that can be kind of uh, problematic getting a hold of them on that sometimes, but we are working with them on, on that. But please do, uh, if you do see something on the road, make sure you're, you're calling that into MCON or just you have my contact information now, you can just let me know. Um, for gen they have a general inquiries, and then the superintendent, I put his contact info here as well. So Dylan Thornton, he's uh, MCON superintendent for your area. Um, he's also a great contact to have. <coughs> Service area two. All right, so this is uh, the map just breaking down service area two. So like Sean mentioned, uh, our area goes from Mount Sicker up into uh, Cook Creek and then over to the west coast. So I really only share a little tip of the CVRD with Sean. Uh, so we've got Saltaire, a piece of Chimaneus, uh, and Yellow Point area. Um, these are some of our key contacts. So um, TMCBC, they deal with our province, so that's the same contact there for any really large emergencies. 
Uh, there's myself as the operations manager, and then the area manager in my area that takes care of uh, the area in the CVRD would be Bryce Pirazzini, uh, and he does Highway 1 uh, with Mount Sicker northbound, Chimenez, Saltair, and Yellow Point, as well as uh, Lady Smith. And then for service area two, our maintenance contractor is Main Road Mid-Island. Uh, we do point a lot of the public to their 24-hour hotline for any immediate safety concerns. Um, however, Stephanie Yancey is the operations manager over with Main Road. Uh, some of you might remember him as a previous operations manager of the ministry. Uh, that's who I took over from. And his contact information is there if anybody would like to reach out. <coughs> over to you. Thank you, Nikki. So we'll go over some of my accomplishments that I that I made in 2021-22. Uh, so uh, our rehabilitation program. So that's that's basically decided at our capital regional level, uh, where we we call it our multi-year re rehab program. So we decide which of our numbered routes are going to be paved, and we look at some of our side roads. So there's something called capitalized paving. And that's if we're putting down over 450 tons of asphalt. So it's not just patches of pavement, they are longer stretches. Uh, so, so that's essentially what we're talking about here. So in last year we did Highway 1, uh, we did Miller to, to Mays, uh, which I'm sure a lot of you know. We did an overlay uh, from Mays Road uh, to Drinkwater, and then north of Drinkwater we did patching. We also did uh, Highway 18, Somenos to the Trans, or, yeah, to the Trans Canada. Uh, we did Highway 1A as well. Uh, that's West Home Road, Shimanus Road, and Mount Sicker. Uh, the total contract value of those was ten and a half million. Um, and then just our QP, that's quantified, basically quantified paving. So some of our quantified stuff that we did last year, that's again, we have a fifteen million dollar year contract value. Uh, so some of the stuff that we did last year, you can I won't read them all out. You guys can read that just fine. So uh, yeah, we did quite a few uh, roads in the C CVRD. Uh, we put a lot more money, I think, in the CVRD uh, than we're going to be able to next year. And I'm only saying that because I've taken a look at our two-year program. Uh, so every two years, the maintenance contractor, MCON, puts together a kind of a work plan. And that's very fluid. That's going to move around and shift as things come up, obviously. Uh, but yeah, we we do have a responsibility for our whole service area one so it'd be nice if i could just pump all of our money into the cvrd every year uh, but we do have to share uh, and we're going to try to to hit up some of the gulf islands this year they've been neglected for the past 20 years so uh, we've kind of made a, a soft commitment to to do some paving over there uh, continued with our accomplishments, uh, there is approximately 1.8, th this, it was much, actually much more than, but that, just what I have here, that's 1.8 million. Um, these are for emer emergency repairs, so through those atmospheric rivers, like I was saying, we had 110 sites in service area alone, which is a lot, uh, but nobody really noticed because of what was happening on the mainland, like they were just devastated, so no, like we got off pretty easy, I think. Uh, but we did obviously have a lot of sites that uh, that needed to be remediated. So yeah, that, there you go. There's I'm not going to read all of those, but yeah, about 1.8 million dollars plus is right right there. And we're still doing those. We've probably wrapped up about <coughs> half of our DFAA sites, half of the 110. Some of the bigger ones are are still. We actually went to a project manager. We went to external consultants to solve these. These are going to be put out to tender. They're major projects. This is, I'm talking about thin ones like the Malahat. Uh, we have one on on Pender Island uh, where, that are mul like they're probably going to be 20 million plus. Um, so those are still ongoing. Here's a map just showing some of the the paving that we did. Uh, so the Miller to Mays and uh, Highway 18 paving was about 6.4 million. That that was. 23 lane kilometers, so that's pretty good. Prices have gone up considerably uh, over the past year. Uh, like I said, I've been here since 2014, and uh, the asphalt prices have, have doubled since I, I was here. Um, and then again, the Gulf Islands, the reason why they've been neglected for as long as they have is for accessibility. It's, it's pretty much twice as much uh, to send materials over there. So. Yeah, it's it's it, it's a complicated job, you know, allocating your funds. And uh, there's actually a point that I'd like to talk about a little bit later uh, with the board here um, that, that might help us with that. Uh, but again, we're, we'll just continue on with some maps. So this is our Highway 1, the Mount Sicker, Shimanus Road, and West Home Road. 
Um, that was just recently wrapped up. And some of our, our planning. Uh, so I'm sure most of you know, yes, we are looking at Highway 1 at South Shawnigan Lake Road. Uh, that went out to tender for an RFP, so we're basically going to be reviewing what our options are to make that intersection safer. Um, we are, the hot topic here is these three left turns off of the Trans Canada. Um, yeah, we're working on those. So Coxila, Fisher and Hutchinson Road, we are, are planning on putting some protected left turn lanes. Um, those three intersections have received a lot of media attention recently. So uh, Coxila and Hutchinson Road, ha those have been designed. We have put in the order with Raylec, they're our electrical contractor. Uh, so it's just a matter of time for those to be, for the hardware to be installed. Fisher Road, uh, that one's still in design, unfortunately, but we would like to have all three of these intersections constructed with protected left turn lanes by uh, the end of our fiscal, which is the end of March. So uh, there's also, in Nikki's area, they're, they're rehabbing Shemanus Bridge. Uh, tender's supposed to go out uh, for that in 20, <coughs> well, this year. It is a two-year project. Um, there's in my back to my service area Greendale Road culvert, <laughs> so that's a that's a really really big one. That one's with our design still. Ian and I have talked about that a little bit, but uh, with that one still in design, it's going to be a, a big project. I believe there are four or five culverts involved with that one. So, and and when I say culverts, I mean structures. Like these are giant culverts. Um, flood mapping. So Mount Sicker is is notorious for flooding out on, right at the Trans Canada there. So we're we're trying to come up with ways that we can mitigate that as best we can. Uh, we're, we are working with the CBRD, with EMBC, with Halalt, um, Stamanis was there, uh, Penelope was there. We we're all trying to figure out what we can do about this. It's it is a complicated project. It's not our road's fault. That's not why the it's actually the uh, Shemanus River floods out. They did just recently dredge that, which I'm sure you're all aware of. So hopefully that's going to help. And there's a project uh, where they're planning on possibly diking parts of the river as well. Uh, but we're looking at what we can do with our road itself um, to facilitate that water going under it instead of flooding it. Uh, and then we've got some more DFAA again. That's, uh, that's that from that atmospheric river. We've got some statutory right-of-way issues that we're cleaning up. I, I'm sorry if I breeze through that too fast. I'm just uh, looking oh, he, at the time here. He just so, hit the timer. Right yeah, on. yeah. I <laughs> so, was I was just about to ask you ask for more time, but you hit it right on the head. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you must have done this a couple times. Yeah, no, actually, it's my because I know how <laughs> fat, how much as well as all of us you want to get to the questions. So uh, I and, see and a lot. I know what I got to go. So <laughs> <laughs> no, no. yeah, we dragged it on so long earlier. Um, we have no time for questions. Yeah. Um, so um, before we do go to questions, obviously, I know you're here and we'll, we'll do our best to, to keep the process efficient today, but we do have those contacts. So if we get too deep down any rabbit holes, because I have a lot too, um, but they get letters from me in different ways. It, um, before so, we get into questions, yeah. there was quickly one more thing. I don't know if I have to request more time. No, no, but go th ahead. There is something I'd like to talk about. So to, to, to help us, uh, as I mentioned, we, we plan our, our program, our work program, uh, two years in advance. And again, that is a fluid document. But uh, to help us, instead of each director coming at us individually, what would be really helpful to us is when you have your wants as, as a director, maybe approach the CVRD management team or, or the board, the chair, and, and prioritize those amongst yourselves. And then give us a list of, of your all agreed upon priorities. So whoever survives that exercise gets to talk so that, to you that guys. That way right? I don't have to prioritize all the asks. You guys prioritize those <laughs> asks. And, and that way it's, it's more equitable, I, I feel that way. And uh, I, I think the same would go for Nikki. Yeah. So uh, of course, with, uh, if, if you'd like, if you have a, uh, you just want an update or something like that, I don't think there's an issue connecting with me or one of my area managers. I don't, don't see a problem with that at all. But I'm just talking about when you have those asks. So when you have those asks, anything in the future, if you could please talk, talk amongst yourselves and, and uh, maybe prioritize those amongst yourselves and then give us a list of those priorities and then we can pick off that. Okay, you that did give us the contacts. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> and to everyone in the region who Don't. happens to watch the, the meeting. So I did get a couple hands. Can you please put your hands back up if you want to be on the list? 
Uh, wow. <laughs> um, usually the municipal directors take that to their municipal tables, but uh, I'll start with, it looks like we have everybody pretty well, so I'm going to start with Director McClinton and we'll just go round table. And if you decide to say, I'll pass, um, I'm sure your colleagues would appreciate it. Go ahead, Director McClinton. Through the chair, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. I got a softball for you. I'm um, just curious why the service area is separated uh, Saltaire with Thetis Island and Penelicut, they're all one area. Is there any thought process there? I don't have the answer for that. <laughs> I don't know the process that went into that. We, I know that the boundary, the, like the Mount Sicker boundary did recently change, but that was mostly for the contract for their ease of turning around and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I can't say for that, though. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah every, every boundary doesn't align with another, right? It doesn't matter, education, highways, <laughs> health areas. Director Abbott. Through the chair. Um, thank you for a great presentation, the introductions. And I did meet Francois a couple of weeks ago. He's a good man. Uh, we were talking about uh, Fairbanks, so thank you. Great. Um, Allenby Road. I have many questions, yep. but I'd like to focus on Allenby. Of course. So you'd like an update on Allenby. Yeah, I can, I can certainly give you one. So Allenby Road, where the slide happened there, that's actually not Ministry of Transportation right away, where the slide occurred. Our road was impacted. And obviously that's why we had to close the road uh, because there is that safety issue there. Um, so the slide itself happened on Couch and Tribes land. So we can't really do the work. We, it's a complicated issue is where I'm trying to go with that. So we are working with Couch and Tribes. So we're working with the MBC to try to figure out how Couch and Tribes would like to address this. And we have offered our help, whether that's financial aid or like labor and uh, we're just kind of waiting for Couch and Tribes. They have uh, procured WSP as their engineering consultant, and we would like WSP to give us a prescriptive fix for the slope. They have given us a pres prescriptive fix for the slope, but it's for the entire slope. And of course, that's, so then you're talking about something that we'd never be able to, to deliver. Uh, so what we would like is just where the failure happened to be brought back to a pre-slide condition so it's still going to be a slope that's unstable, for, for lack of a better term. Uh, but we do want to open that road. And before we open it, we need to secure that one section, though. Uh, so we are waiting for WSP to give us that prescription for that one section. And of course, there is the other matter of the houses that are on top of that crest. Uh, they have been evacuated. Um, and I know Couch, this is nothing to do with us, of course, but Couch and Tribes is working with the MBC uh, to, to perhaps move those houses or get them into somewhere else permanently. I know they're temporarily somewhere else, but yeah, like I said, that's not us, though. But. Thank you. Director Segal. <coughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm Kate Segal. I'm from Area A, Milby, Malahat. Um, and I, uh, Ministry of Transportation is the very first uh, group I reached out to when I moved to the area because I live right across from an elementary school and was trying to get a crosswalk. Uh, I didn't get the crosswalk, but somehow I ended up at this table. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, you know, I've met with Francois and have shared, you know, some of the concerns of my community and, uh, you know, get the sense that no is the answer to, you know, a lot of those solutions. I understand. Um, you know, your restrictions about what, you know, the Ministry of Transportation is meant to do around providing roads for cars to drive on. But I just want to talk about the a general public that lives in these rural areas that now have higher populations and a real sense of a lack of public safety around being on those roads, particularly with children, schools that now have, you know, 500 to 1,000 students and not enough parking for safe drop-off, no crosswalks, no sidewalks, um, no safe place for kids to cross, and yet they cross kind of all over the place. And in communications that I've had with different MOTI people, sometimes the feedback just feels like justification as to why n absolutely nothing can be done without a like sense of compassion that like the potential incidences or fatalities are like people we know and so I don't really know what the solution is other than incorporation. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the answer, that's what I was going to say. No. <laughs> Which is, yes, the whole other, like, you know, road we're trying to pave. No, I, um, I, I, I kind of get a sense of where yeah. you're going with this. So 
there is active transportation is something the Ministry of Transportation takes very <coughs> seriously. Uh, there are grants that are available to the CBRD, uh, whether that's grants, grant money for design or grant money for construction. So I definitely urge you to apply for those if this is a concern of yours. So you can t if you're, you're successful in getting that grant money, you can apply that to building pathways. You can apply, you'd of course have to get what's called the license of occupation with us. Uh, just because we're the, the landowners on that section, but uh, th that's certainly an option. With school parking, we, there's not a lot we can do there. The parking really isn't our mandate. We don't work with like in private or public schools, but their parking problems isn't, they're, they're not, we do have our own parking problems, <laughs> but giving people parking isn't really, we, we do park and rides and stuff like that. Uh, but that's again part of active transportation and that's to help people with catching the bus and that sort of thing. Uh, now, the Ministry of Transportation, we can also prioritize. So that, that would just be another ask that I would probably put in. So what we could do is possibly widen the road. Uh, if you're looking for a separated shoulder, that's something that you guys, the CBRD, would have to deliver. Um, and there are some sort of engineering requirements that we look for uh, as well. So we could talk about that another time. But uh, the Ministry, what we would do in, if, if we got funding or if we had available funding, is we would just widen the road and then put a fog line on that road so it would be like a 1.5 meter shoulder for people to walk on. And then crosswalks, uh, unfortunately, we would love to give people crosswalks, but they have to be engineered, they have to go through our warranting system with our engineers. There's certain sight lines they wanna see, they look at speed limits on the road, they look at how many vehicles are on the road, vehicle type, they look at a bunch of stuff and it has to fit that warranting system. And that's provincial wide, that's not just this area, that's throughout the whole province, so. And, and I just wanna say, we're compassionate too, like we live in these communities too, so. Yeah, I think, but you probably also field a lot of complaints. And, and so I think just, I totally understand that fatigue and then how it can sometimes just feel like a bit of a brick wall, like, you know, absolutely no for a crosswalk, I, you know, I've, I've had different conversations with different reps, and some of them are very compassionate, you're right, but like, kind of like the wall of Ministry of Transportation sometimes feels like really hard for rural communities to like get what, what they, they desire, right? Probably because we have that, provin it, the provincial warrant. It has to apply yeah. to these very rigid, strict warranting, you know. Yeah, yeah totally. So. so just on that school, part um, I, I've I've been on this you know back and forth between uh, yeah you don't provide parking and uh, then the school district says well yeah everyone's supposed to take the bus and so both sides have a, like um, an excuse but there's just this existing problem mm -hmm. so I would lo like advocate for Ministry of Transportation and the school districts to like talk more and see if there is some kind of solution. I have giggles beside me. Maybe that, that's not possible. I, I could tell possible. you, like, like I said, I worked uh, as an area manager for the CRD for seven years. Uh, what they do uh, is they do that, it's they connect with the school districts mm -hmm. and uh, they also connect with the municipalities and they have something called Ready Step Roll that I'm sure yeah. you've heard of. And they, the schools have to volunteer to be part of the program and then everyone, including the Ministry of Transportation, go to these school meetings and they talk about active transportation. How, mm -hmm. And they even gather statistics on how many students walk to school, how many get dropped <laughs> off, where, like is there, congestion at drop-off, and they look at all these issues as a collective. But that's the CRD and Saanich that do that. So I don't know if you're interested no, in doing that. Yeah, I'll definitely look into Ready, Step, Roll. Thank yeah. you. Okay, thank you. And before we continue to go around, this is exactly what we were asked not to do. Um, so if we can please resist the urge to go into each of our specific issues in our areas, um, because really we do have a lot of business to do today. Um, but uh, as was said, and I know this has happened before at Electoral Area Services, that priority setting discussion um, that then can be engaged with the ministry around some of the key concerns. But if we go issue by issue, I'm keeping count of we'll the time. We'll be here all day. Yeah, <laughs> and, and we've got a, a long agenda and people that have other commitments later in the day that they need to get to. So, um, But I'll continue around the table if anybody has a quick comment or a question, and if we can just try and keep it as condensed as possible. Director Wilson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. 
Nice to put a face to the, uh, the name, Sean. Uh, welcome here. Um, thank you very much, first of all, for working with myself and with the community to get those three crossings. That's going to be a major improvement in my area, and um, the sooner, the, obviously, the sooner the better. But thank you for that. Um, two things, or rather, the first thing is um, this is now, you, you've been broadcasting to the world right here. And a lot of the questions which are coming up and the answers you've given there are of very great interest to the community. And I use social media a lot. Do you have any objections to me pointing on social media this part of the video so that people in the areas can watch it? I don't want to put you out on a limb and get you all sorts of questions. I don't mind, Mike. You no? Do that, yeah. Okay. Look out. It's a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. That, yeah. That, I, I mean, it, it, people are... If people ha want to get a hold of me, they're going to get a hold of me. Yeah. So okay. I, I don't. This is, this will answer a lot of the questions that people have, though. But yeah. thank thank you for that. It's good to see you here. It's good to see you too, man. Thank you, and I, I hope I can hire you as a consultant director, Wilson, because somehow we ask for similar things in Ladysmith, and our accesses get closed. You get controlled intersections. So very. <laughs> For half the population, it's amazing. You're, you're uh, in the wrong service area. I'm just kidding. I'm, just... <laughs> I'm going to keep my comments to a very small limit. I, I was just trying to inject some humor into it, but <laughs> I'd laugh if it was at all funny. But uh, Director McGonagall. Well, I believe the reciprocal humor was sent to you as well from uh, yeah. the podium. Uh, just a quick comment. Ditching, I see that as a problem in rural areas uh, with water control. Wildlife uh, interactions on Highway 18, something uh, more that might be able to be done instead of just flashing lights. Okay, Thank yeah, you. Highway 18. So we have a Leonard Selecki is, is our director for our animal wildlife program. So he gathers data on uh, migration cycles and, and all this kind of stuff. So every time we do a brand new project, we are actually looking at incorporating safe passage under our highway, uh, like Highway 14 actually. We're, we're currently doing a, uh, a road realignment project uh, right at Gillespie, and that's, that's part of this project. There is three animal crossings that are on there. Uh, but in terms of those lights that are on, so you're, you're talking about elk crossings. Uh, in talking with, with uh, Leonard, he says that uh, those flashing light signs, those are a few years old, so they're not that old. And he said that those were warranted uh, back a few years ago uh, when even the counts, so the, what we do is whenever the contractor is sent out to pick up roadkill or something like that, they have to document the, the animal that was struck uh, and where it was struck. So we have that data. Um, wildlife collision data and that wildlife collision data is actually not as high as you'd think it is on highway 18. so i don't know if there's going to be a, a, f a plan uh, in the future to do anything in, like in the immediate future i mean but in future uh yeah if we do a, a major rehab project on highway 18 we'd probably look at something like that and then your other comment about ditching um ditching is something that we do contractually with mcon uh, we it's it's quantified so our contract is split up between quantified work things and routine work things so the routine things are like a stop sign gets falls down or there's a pothole in the road they're not going to say oh we've hit our quota we're not doing any more of those this year so they ha there's no quota for those but ditching there is there's a quota for how many lineal meters they do each year and so they have to prioritize which roads get ditched when uh, and more to that they subcontract uh, Kootenai Gradle from the Kootenays to come in to do their ditching. So it, it is a very structured, and everyone in the province does it. The, the, our service uh, contractor is not the only one that does. So Kootenai Gradle actually has a patent on this machine. It's much faster, so instead of a <coughs> excavator digging this way, it can draw, it has this patent, so this machine drives and it ditches as it drives. Anyways, uh, <laughs> it's very, very efficient, but it's not efficient that they can do all of our roads every year. Now, with the flooding as well, um, this has been a bit of a hot topic with us, as I imagine it has from you, especially after the atmospheric river. Uh, so there is um, our ditches. I, I'd like to say that our ditches are meant only for road runoff. 
So the rain that comes out of the sky hits our road prism. It's, that's what it's collecting. It's not meant to collect anything from a, a adjacent properties. So each private property is supposed to take care of their own drainage. So uh, anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out there because a lot of people actually don't know that. And they think our ditches are just meant to take on flooding water and stuff, and they're, they're not. So. <laughs> so many things I could say, but we're trying to get through this. So, Director Morrison. And I will be concise. Uh, so, firstly, I just noticed something that I sure hope is a map error, and it shows a public highway uh, designated on North Shore route, Road at Lake Couch and all the way around to uh, Dididat's community. My understanding was that public highway, though not it's been announced, hasn't been acquired, should be South Shore Road as far as a public highway. So I'd like to follow up with you offline on that sure. because I, I'm pretty sure that's an error. Okay. Uh, so, and, and I'd love to talk subdivision improving officer, but, but we'll do that offline. A general question, and, and this is for, you know, everybody in the, in the rural areas, and, and I, I get you guys have to prioritize. But the side roads are basically disintegrating, and yet I know your priorities are numbered highways, 80K roads, some 50K roads. I'm not complaining about the, the service that I've got, but I guess counter to that, uh, folks that drive out from the rural communities come and see like that stretch from Salmonos to number one on Highway 18, scratching our heads wondering, huh? The, the, the road didn't seem to be in need of repaving, and it was repaved, and yet in the rural, more remote rural areas, they're not, side roads just, I can't tell you what year they were last touched. So is does it require political action to the, the people, you know, at senior ministry, political level, to get an initiative that will address rural side roads? Because it, it, I know you guys don't, there's just not enough in the kitty to do that. And yeah, that, that you're basically answering your own question. So I mean, yes, of course, being going political, it is a matter of you have this much money and you have to make it go this far. So that is quite challenging sometimes. And it's not like, and it is, it's often a matter of, of money. So that, that one section of Highway 18, we like, when we do our M MYRP, we like to, we like to pair our, our roads kind of close together so that you're, you're saving, you, you get more asphalts and you're not paying for mobilization. So when we do a numbered route, like when we did Highway 1, we decided to do that section of Highway 18 just because it was there. So it just made sense. And, and, uh, and again, that's all initiated uh, from, from our regional folks too. So if you do, if, if, if it, it, it ultimately does come down to money, unfortunately. Uh, so I, I think it would be wise to, if, to make it political. But at the same time, if we're talking about a, a rural side road that you know 12 people live on, are we going to put millions of dollars there? That's another. So we have to be, we have to be strategic on how we allocate our funds. Um, yeah. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, <coughs> continuing on, Director Nicholson. Sean, nice to meet you. I'm Allison Nicholson. Nice to meet you. And Sean. I've got a community that's going crazy about Miller Road and Allenby Road. Yeah, Miller. But Miller. You know that, so we'll, I do we'll, know that. We'll talk about it offline. Okay. But I do want to say that. Um, well, I want to ask a question first of all. I, I, it would be really helpful if you could come to a community meeting and explain stuff. I mean, in person, that that is really helpful. I've done it before in, in previous terms, and people people calm down a lot when they feel they're being attended to. <laughs> yeah, that's we, one. That's one thing. And the other thing is that particular issue really, I think, highlights the problem that we have about multiple jurisdictions dealing with stuff and yeah road safety is number one problem mm -hmm. and I, I just figure think we need to talk more collaboratively about how we can address that so. absolutely okay thank you thank you director deck Hi, I'm microphones please microphone. sorry, sorry. <coughs> I'm from Ubo and uh, Ryan Giroux took me on a tour of our whole area and I was really grateful for that and I did show him the, the places in the highway that are crumbling for sure. So I guess, and, and the flooding that happens historically in the houses behind. Um, but my question is, 
is there climate change money that could be used or that you have access to to make bigger culverts to take the run runoff off the mountain it's not a floodplain in there it comes off the mountain that could reroute that water instead of it overfilling you know that because it's more severe now right than ever before so are you talking about right at maple maple ridge maple ridge no 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 further down uh, mead creek okay the turn off uh, to mead okay creek. i think i know what you're talking about yeah the, the yeah, so, <clears throat> and there are houses along the side of you of the yubo road that are this is talking about my personal issues but sorry i'm just wondering if there's climate money for bigger culverts there is, uh, so we do have climate action funding that is available, but that's for, that's specifically for when things go wrong. So it's not, it's not really, uh, it's not available, not yet anyways, it will, it will, it will be available for upgrades, but if we have, we need a, a hydrogeological engineer to tell us that this culvert needs to be upgraded, right? It's, it's, so there has to be a number of, of uh, investigative studies done before we go in and, and upgrade a culvert, especially a larger culvert. If, like if we're talking about a structure, uh, things get very complicated and very heavily engineered at that point. So it's very slow moving. Uh, but in terms of just the funding piece, um, there, there, w that's what we do. That's what I do on a regular basis. We have X amount of culverts that we upgrade uh, just through our quantified plan. Uh, so that's probably something we would look at there, okay, not through you. our climate well, action board. Yeah, thank so thank you. Of course. Director Martman. Diamond um, North Oyster, so hi, Nikki. Hello. <laughs> you can step up to the mic now. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, thank you for the presentation. I guess just a quick comment about the presentation. I'd love to see more from you. From me? Yes. So be about SA2. Yes. About Yellow Point, Diamond, um, Saltair. Yeah. Because we don't see the accomplishments listed as we do for the South End. So yes, it's so, very surface area one heavy. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. so I'd like to see a little bit more on that when you, when you come back at another time. I would be uh, happy to. Yeah. And uh, I can certainly share some contacts with you as well. So yeah. we can get in touch and, and talk about some of the things that have gone on in your community and, and some of the accomplishments that we've had. So I, yeah. I'd be happy to take that offline and we can connect. Yeah. No, I, and, and, but just for the future. But I Definitely. Guess the, the, only, the question I have is I will often know about, I'm sure other directors may find the same thing. I'll find out about a, a paving project yes. um, when, when everybody tells me, hey, the road got paved. Um, and so you were talking about um, how we might get involved earlier on in your planning. Yes. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about that because I'd like to know what, how far in advance and what we can do because that is a, yeah. a lot of interest to my community. Definitely. So, I mean, rule of thumb is the earlier you can catch us, the better. Uh, we're currently uh, undergoing a bunch of our planning for our next year's fiscal that begins in April. Um, so, I mean, even connecting now and, and sharing your priorities and some of your concerns, we would be happy to start reviewing them and considering them and trying to build them in if there's any room. Um, if not, it would, you know, start to be considered for f subsequent fiscal years. Um, however, much like... Um, some of your colleagues here uh, going around and having a drive, we could always connect and go around and you can show me some of your priorities as well as the Bryce, who's our area manager, um, so that we can discuss those things in a little bit more detail and get, get them on the priority list. Yeah. Director Staples. Hi, thanks for your presentation and for coming in. I just want to sort of put it out there that I'm the mayor for the city of Duncan. I've been on council for a number of terms now and we have been consistently speaking about from um, Allen B all the way to the, the through the highway corridor to Beverly and I would love to reach out I will be reaching out to you um, to extend another invite to yeah. um, come together with area director mm -hmm. uh, North Couch and Duncan and Couch and Tribes to have a discussion about some of the ongoing issues we have um, in terms of safety and also lighting issues so that we're all there together mm -hmm. and not having separate conversations so I just wanted to put that out there and thanks very much for coming today thank you thank you director Douglas yeah, quickly, Mr. Chair. Um, I think this we yeah, directed more to you, Ms. Schneider. It's the uh, development you're probably familiar with on the Highway 9090 Trans Canada. Just, I sure am. All right. So <laughs> we, we sent out a letter yesterday, and again, Mr. Chair, I don't mean to delve into the details of our own specific situation, North Caption, yep. but there is some time constraints around that one. Yes. The developer is uh, supportive of the change in the access for the development, mm -hmm. but he's working under some tight timelines. So uh, February 10th is when we're hoping to hear back, and I'm. 
Yeah. Sure, your team gets a lot of correspondence. You're very busy, but if there's any way you could back to us before the annual, the developer and the residents, I think, would all be very happy with that. Definitely. And I know a lot of com communication has come out in regards to that, that development and um, some of the restrictions that we've put on about access to the highway. So we are working together. I saw that email come in, as well as Mike Pearson, our director. So we will be working to respond as quickly as we can on that one. Great. And if you need any information from the municipality or we, we're in contact with the developer yeah. as well, we're happy to help in any way we can. Sounds great. Great, yeah, thank you. We will make sure that we get you something back. Okay, perfect. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Director Acton. Thank you. Hi, Sean. Sierra from Shawnigan Lake. Nice, nice to have a face to the name. Yeah. Uh, first, MCON has been like amazing, so great lately. Um, and uh, it would be really nice for the community to have some kind of South Shawnigan update on that we can share with the community. Because I feel like the only information we have seen at the community level is some reporting that maybe is not 100%. Are we talking about the intersection of the yeah. trans candidates? So I don't have any information okay. to give you. Um, like I said, that has been that was put out to tender, and that's when it kind of hit the hit right. the media. Um, I haven't even heard who who has won that. So right, I, but maybe I, just something that's. And, and right you know, now, like I said, they're looking what, what at the many, goal many is ideas. and everything. So that's that's the update. There, there's tons of options that they're going to be looking at. So, okay. Yeah. Nothing big. No. Um, and I hope when you saw me today, you went, "Oh shoot, I haven't gotten back to her." <laughs> and because speaking of T <laughs> Tina Rogers and your predecessor, they spent a lot of time in Shawnee and Lake working with economic development and, and on um, and some improvements in our village. So I hope mm -hmm. you're going to be able to. I, I feel like that has dropped off the ministry. It did drop uh, off somehow, and I'm gonna. I'm waiting for you to make it right. So, um, yeah. So Francois, let's talk will, about how we can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Francois will get the ball rolling on that one again. Okay. So Tina Thank just you. unfortunately, when she left, uh, there wasn't a lot of information that and, was transferred. And, and before you, um, Don Lego. Don retired, so he was part of it too. Yeah. Part of, um, anyway, so they were part of all the planning and everything around that. So that's great. We're, we're looking forward to working on that again thank you thank you is that and short enough great thanks <laughs> and this is just the top <laughs> oh yeah um you know and i just something i've noted in our area i live in area h um and so i'd also love to hear and see more um from you like a, a similar update yeah and i appreciate i think it should be at this table because we represent um those people mm -hmm. as well at this table so areas gh and the town of ladysmith um and, you know, I quipped about it, but if you look into the files, you can tell there's been, the town of Laysmith has a lot of issues mm -hmm. and frustrations with the response of our calls for safety improvements as well and the response from MOTI and how that negatively impacts our community. Um, but also in our area, um, in the, we talked about ditching and they did some ditching projects. And I don't know what was on the machine, um, but now we have a influ uh, just a flow through of invasive species, broom and mm -hmm. uh, other invasive species pr spreading onto private property after the ditching was done about four or five years ago they were all cleaned out and then they're flooded with broom and other invasive species so uh, questions for another day but nobody talked about invasive species so I want to throw that on the fire pile. we do have an invasive species contact so if you okay. let Nikki know exactly yes. where yeah. she can get all to along Rocky <laughs> Creek Road in the yeah. area H it's great. but yeah uh, uh, yeah, we do have an invasive species contact. So okay. I, I'd love to connect with you as well, uh, and we can talk about um, some of your concerns in Ladysmith and the invasive species conversation and, and pick it up from there. And cool. so you know, Chair Stona, our director is from, he lives in Ladysmith yeah. as well. So my, yeah, Mike, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, so you can leverage yeah. that a little bit. <laughs> well, yeah. Try and ride a bike through Coronation Square since they've made those intersection improvements, but we won't, improvements. <laughs> But you won't go there. You have to cross the road five times to get back on the Trans Canada Trail. It seems impossible, but yes, five times. <laughs> okay, so we're moving on. I want to thank you very much for your presentation and for coming here. And obviously, especially for the electoral area directors, really important conversation. So hopefully, we can continue that at committee um, and engage with you further on those priorities uh, as we go forward. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you for having thank us. You. All right. Yes. I'm looking at I'm looking at the chair. I think that we can set it up in agenda review and make that invite and 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So uh, we've been here for an hour and a half for our delegations. So we'll just take a, uh, a, a seven minute break, 305, and then maybe we come back with a sense of focus that we haven't had found yet today. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. We're back. And Mr. Robbins, where are we? Thank you, Mr. Chair. We're on. We must be almost done this meeting. Uh, a motion to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> you had a mover. Uh, the chair hasn't recognized the mover in the second. <laughs> so. Uh, I'm not aware of anything under report from the chairperson. So it's uh, item seven, correspondence. First item is correspondence with the Regional District in Nanaimo. Uh, the follow-up regarding the CVRD's proposed joint bioregional growth strategy. This is for your information. This Thank you. Um, so it's there for information. Um, I think it was, this might have come out of our discussion around Nanaimo Airport and regional growth referrals. It did, yeah, I remember that Zoom meeting. Um, and actually had Dave Devanna at our council last night and we referred to that conversation as well. Um, so as we see here, um, you know, the regional district in Nanaimo doesn't entertain that interest at this time, but uh, good information for us. And as we have our own internal discussions around regional growth, perhaps we can entice them into a further conversation as we move down the line. All right. Mr. Robbins. And C2 is a correspondence from Mayor Staples with regards to the Vancouver Island and Coastal Communities Climate Leadership Plan Steering Committee representation. Mayor Staples. Uh, thank you. So uh, we're just requesting to all the regional districts again, uh, the Vancouver Island Climate Leadership um, Committee has representatives from the RDs across Vancouver Island. I actually sit on there as one of the um, co-chairs um, with previous mayor um, of Tofino, Josie Osborne, and previous mayor of Victoria, Lisa Helps. We were the tri-chairs. And so we, I, I'm appointed by the city for that, but we have, um, regional directors from every area on Vancouver Island and Vancouver Island Coastal Communities. And um, director, I was gonna say Allison, was <laughs> um, our, our chair, our, our representative last time. And so for continuity, because there was a lot of 
um, turnover this term. It would be fantastic if um, Director Nicholson would be there as well with an alternate. And um, at least for the first year, while well, we transition from the work that we were doing into uh, moving forward next year. And there'll be presentation of this at AVICC this year, so you'll get more in-depth information. And I'm, I just, in the because it's already been a long day, I don't want to get too much into the whole structure of the committee and um, all of its purpose and everything. But it's essentially to look at Vancouver Island, if we were, uh, you know, our own entity and Vancouver um, and uh, coastal communities, what would we be doing to working together um, on climate change as a whole entity? So. Director Nicholson, are you willing to be to, to, to uh, continue to stand in that role? I am, and maybe we could put on the agenda a, 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 an update when we have more time. Yeah. Because I think it, it would be good for the new people. Thank you. Director McGonagall? I would move Director Nicholson as our representative on this committee. Seconded by Director McClinton. I was going to call him Director Doctor. Jesse. <laughs> And I believe uh, we were looking for an alternate as well. Yeah, do we have a, a volunteer as the alternate in that role? I would put my name forward if uh, if so desired by the board. Is there a, it's moved and seconded, but is there another that would like to get into that melee? <laughs> Let's make it an election. Director Deck, would you like to also volunteer as the alternate? So um, I will yield to my female <laughs> friend across the table. Thank you. I'm glad I didn't accept that motion. <laughs> I'm still on. Uh, so we have Director Deck and Director McGonagall has graciously stepped aside. Do we have any others that wish to uh, serve in that role at this time? Okay. So we have Director Deck. Can we get a motion for Director Deck to be the alternate? Direct, moved by Director Morrison, seconded by Director Justice. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. Mr. Chair, that way I don't have to do a speech. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, because we know how short those speeches are on a day like this. All right, so I believe we've dealt with that. Mr. Robbins. Uh, agenda item eight is information, just a, a board calendar for February. Something new that we've just added to your agenda here, so you get a snapshot. And I realize that we send out invitations and everything for your calendars and your devices, but we're putting this on here as well so that you can get a glance, see what's coming up in February. Thank you. I have Director Acton and then Director Nicholson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I noticed that um, on the 23rd, we have a budget meeting starting at 8 a.m. Well, I talked about, I hope that's an error because um, some of us have kids to get to school and that is very early. Thank you. I put that through to staff. I'm, I'm just feverishly scrolling to that date. I know I have it in my calendar, but I see it at, I do also see it at both 8 and 9.30 in my board. So I have a special board from 9.30 to 4, day one, review all budgets. And then I also have special board 8 to 4.30, um, but I think that may have been a placeholder, but that's through to staff. 9.30 start? Okay. So we'll, uh, we'll look to, if you haven't got the other one, I'll ask uh, folks to um, know that the, the duplicate entry there is the 8 to 4, but there is a 9.30 to 4 where it's got more details. It says review of all budgets with the WebEx link uh, for 9.30 to 4 o'clock on February 23rd. That is the correct. Okay. Thank you. So if we can, I don't know if we can try and fix that cal duplicate calendar entry just to avoid the confusion. We certainly will. Thank you. Director Nicholson. I just want to say thank you. That was really helpful to be able to see it in a glance. And apologies. We'll fine tune it as we're going so that uh, we get it as precise as we can. Okay. Thank you. Good catch. Some of us would have shown up at 8. <laughs> and. <laughs> <laughs> Further discussion on this topic it was for information. Please, Mr. Robbins, move us along. We are moving to committees and commission reports. CR1 is a report and recommendations of the Committee of the Whole of December 14th, 2022. Uh, there is five part uh, recommendation. Director Morrison. <coughs> Given it's been a long day and this has been published in advance, is there any directors that want any of the items 
one through five pulled. Seeing none. I would move all five items. Anyway, I seconded by Director Wilson. Any discussion on those items? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. Mr. Robbins. A CRT is the report and recommendation of the Committee of the Whole meeting of January 11, 2023. And there is one recommendation. Director Morrison, move that item. I'd move that item. Seconded by Director Abbott. Any discussion on that item? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. Mr. Robbins. Uh, CR3 is the report and recommendations of the Electoral Area Services Committee meeting of January 18, 2023. Uh, there are four recommendations for the entire board, and then there are subsequent recommendations for Electoral Area Directors only. Um, and you may want to look at uh, recommendation one with regards to the survey uh, and the suggested uh, questions that you may want to submit for that survey on behalf of the CBRD. Thank you. Uh, Director Nicholson. Maybe I'll turn it over to Director Wilson because he chaired the meeting. And oh, I okay, wasn't thank there. you. Director Wilson. <laughs> Caught me unawares there. <laughs> Mr. Chair, um, this, um, the EASC discussed quite a lot of this um, at length, and I can uh, move um, these as blocks if necessary. Yeah. Um, but if there's any discussion uh, or anyone wants anything pulled, I, I want to discuss just one part of what's in here. Okay, so are you saying uh, we, recommendations one to four are through uh, the whole board? Um, uh, no, it would be uh, recommendation, yeah, uh, the first one would be recommendation one dot one through, five. Um, through, four, through three, first of all, uh, because I have one in area one dot one dot one. Uh, question that I want to comment on. D does that make sense to you? Not really. So you're pulling item one. If you want to discuss any okay, part of it. Okay, let's do that then. Yeah, I just want to discuss that one okay, at first. Okay, so but why don't we, we'll, we'll pull the, 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 for all the board, we have items one through four. Okay. You want to discuss parts of item one? Only the potential questions for our health and community survey. Okay, why don't we pull that item and put forward your discussion item on number one. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, can I discuss that now? Yep. Okay, um, one of the, and this is a comment more than anything else. I don't know who brought this question forward, but to me it's one of the most, um, it's one of the, probably the most important questions that we as a board could ask our community. And that question are, is, are you within one paycheck of not paying your bills at the end of the month? That to me is crucial right now at this time, and whoever it was who brought that forward, thank you for bringing it forward, and I would like to make sure that that uh, is included in, in the survey. So if the board um, passes this motion, once it's moved and seconded, these will be forwarded on to, to the health survey. Keep in mind that they'll decide what actually is included, but these are suggestions. Yeah. Um, but I think it's excellent, and actually there's some um, reflection in that I know our municipal f questions that were submitted do to talk about the stress of money and things like that and impacts on health um, so yeah, it's it's definitely an, an interesting question that digs deeper into some of the social determinants of, of health and mental health challenges for yeah. sure yeah so I would uh, um, I would like to bring these forward as a block um, yeah. first of all uh, CR 3 1 uh, through 4 Okay, and you're moving those items? Yes. Thank you. Seconded by Director Staples. Any discussion on those? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then this is for electoral area directors only vote on the following. Um, items 5 through 11. Uh, is there anything that anyone would like pulled there? Director Segal? Yeah, I guess I just... I have a question because um, there was some in the public input portion there was a, some comments about number nine I guess I'm wondering if I'm allowed to speak to them or not yeah yeah if you want to pull number nine we can deal with the rest of the items and then discuss number nine okay uh, I'll pull number nine okay we'll pull number nine director Morrison pull number 11 please and number 11 any others seeing none so we'd be looking for a motion for Electoral area directors only five 
through 11, through uh, sorry, 5 through 11 to, to, to 10 with the exclusion of 9 and 11. Yeah, that'll work. <laughs> I was going to say it differently, but <laughs> yeah, so you know, you're right. moving those items. <laughs> Seconded by Director Nicholson. No discussion on those because nobody wanted them pulled. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. So we'll go to number nine, Director Sagoff. Thank you. Um, so I was on the APC when we went through this application a few years ago, and it was the APC that requested that laundry be removed from the possible um, possible things they could do on the property. It wasn't uh, the fact that they didn't have enough water. That was the, something that APC requested because of known water you know, issues in Mill Bay. Um, and also, uh, we, in that EASC last week, we asked the um, proponent about their their future development and and with water in mind. So they have current water approvals to expand their spa a little bit, but they would need a new well and new water license to continue development beyond that. And so we do know that the province is looking very closely at that and. Um, not approving water licenses unless there's water there. Thank you. Any others that wish to discuss that item before I see it moved and seconded? No. So I'd ask for a motion for number nine, moved by Director Segal, seconded by Director Morrison. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. And there will be a public hearing scheduled for that as well if anyone wants to get further input. Moving on to number 11 then, that was pulled, Director Morrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's just to uh, receive comfort from staff that the uh, rezoning that is being suggested for specifically the Kai Q's fire hall that the uh, property owner in question has uh, more than just a verbal uh, acquiesce to the request and I don't see any staff in the room that might be able to answer maybe somebody's on screen but uh, I, i'd ask for that commitment prior to us adopting this at the board thank you through to staff mr rolf i can speak to that mr chair um i will confirm Sorry, i think your mic was working that's why I no. Oh, sorry. Me. <laughs> okay. Michelle, Michelle sorry. Pressman uh, here. Ms. Pressman, I'll go to you in just a moment. Ms. Trolf did yeah. try to answer, but then her mic wasn't working, so you didn't know yeah, she I was didn't talking. I didn't hear her. No problem. Uh, Ms. Pressman. So I did hear from Ms. Trolf that they'll ensure that that happens before this moves forward, but I didn't know if you had additional comments, Ms. Pressman. That's what I was going to say as well. Okay. <laughs> Move item 11. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Seconded by Director McClinton. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. I believe that takes us to CR4, which was the Committee of the Whole recommendation from this morning. Uh, through to you, Director Morrison. Given this is uh, an item that's come from this morning, I'll read really fast the five items uh, that it be recommended to the board from this morning's meetings. One, that function 405, uh, Couch and Lake Recreation, Couch and Lake Sports Arena, CLS A, exterior cladding replacement project, uh, additional funding of $200,000. Two, function 464, Shawnigan Lake Community Center, LC Miles Roof Replacement Project, additional funding of $325,000. Function 420, Couch and Community Center Phase 1 Roof Replacement Project Funding of $1.75 million. Function 426, Couch and Performing Arts Center Washroom Lounge Renovation Project Additional Funding of $200,000. And Function 411, Cary Park Recreation Boiler Upgrade to Gas Absorption Heat Pump Project Additional Funding of $85,000, from Fortis. BC grant and 43750 from the CBRD. Those are uh, prior uh, approvals, prior to budget being approved, and I move those uh, by item one. Seconded by Director McGonigal. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. Uh, that takes us, I believe, to staff reports. Thank you, Director Morrison, and thank you, all directors. Mr. Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, staff reports, SR1 is a report 
from the Environmental Services Division with regards to the uh, Chemanus River floodplain mapping. Uh, this is referred from uh, uh, the Committee of the Whole this morning. There is a multi-part recommendation and we have staff here to um, answer any questions with <laughs> Thank regards you. to the report. We're all stumbling now. It feels like it's been a longer day than it has been. Um, so we... <laughs> it's only 3.30. Just wait till it's 10 o'clock. Um, <laughs> Director Douglas. Hey, Mr. Chair, the question I had for staff was uh, with regards to the second part of the project with the uh, recommendations in terms of... Uh, mitigation strategy. I know the report indicates that's going to be ready at some point in 2023, but I'm wondering if we could get a bit more detail on when we can anticipate seeing a draft of that or the, the final version uh, during the course, uh, course of the year. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you through the chair to uh, Director Douglas. Uh, that's a great question. We are uh, working with our consultants on that right now. They're uh, looking at a number of different mitigation options, sort of uh, broad so concepts. Um, and then uh, using the hydraulic model that they've developed to, uh, to see what the impacts of those are. So uh, we'll be getting a report from them um, probably March, April time frame. Um, the, uh, the final report that's due to the, uh, the funder is uh, at the end, due at the end of May. Um, that's a little different than uh, what we're looking for in terms of some of the mitigation options will go a bit beyond uh, what the requirements of the grant are. And then that'll lead into uh, um, additional work, uh, you know, recognizing that any of the solutions need to look at the entire watershed scale. So we need to uh, to see what's happening upstream as well as just within the floodplain. Thank you. Follow up. Just with that May May deadline, then. So is the idea there be there would be more work done after submitting that that report to the funder? Uh, through the chair, uh, there could be some additional work beyond that. The, uh, the requirements of the, uh, the NDMP grant, National Disaster Mitigation Program, is for flood mapping and a risk assessment. Um, the mitigation options that we're developing are um, sort of on top of that. They're not just a requirement of that, but we anticipate it all wrapping up at about the same time. Great, and just a last comment, and I know you've met with some of the residents in the area, but we, we do hear from them a lot at, at North Couch, and if there's any way to involve them as much as possible, I know they'd be grateful for that, and obviously living on the land for decades, they've got all kinds of expertise, and I know you're aware of that from having met with them several times already. Yeah, through the chair, uh, absolutely, uh, we've heard that loud and clear, and uh, as we uh, get the uh, these mitigation options firmed up a little bit, then we're going to take those to the community um, and uh, get some feedback on that. Um, obviously, any of these options are going to involve activities that are going to impact uh, First Nations land and private properties, um, also uh, infrastructure within the area. So we need to involve uh, everyone in those discussions, uh, particularly when we get into looking at uh, which are the best mitigation options, what are the criteria that we want to look at for evaluating those options. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Morrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is through you to Mr. Robbins. It seems like it was hours ago. Well, it probably was. Uh, wasn't there a letter of support to Halt First Nations? That yeah, is it going to be a number four or, or additional item or new business? Or it, we, we, we put it under SR2. That was my fault. I'll, I'll take the blame on that one. OK, fair enough. Thanks. <laughs> OK. Or we could add as a number four to the motion to receive the letter of support. Okay, so let's do that. So, so you're moving one through three plus the addition of number four of receiving letter of support. It's seconded by Director Staples. Any further discussion? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. That takes us to public hearings. Mr. Robbins. TH1 is the public hearing minutes uh, with regards to CVRD bylaw number 4275, official community plan for the electoral areas amendment bylaw. PID 025-580-311-2022 and CVRD bylaw number 4276 South Couch and Zoning Amendment bylaw PID 025-580-311-2022. Uh, the recommendation is these minutes be received. Moved by Director Segal, seconded by Director Acton. Any discussion? Seeing none, all the... Oh, sorry, Director Martman. Sorry, just, just don't introduce any new information. 
seeing as these are public hearing minutes. No, I was actually just going to comment on the public hearing minutes. Thank you very much for that nudge. So my comment is about, and I, and I struggle with this as a, as a director because of the 300 meter setback that they talk about from, from schools for cannabis. And some of the um, comments I've heard have been around, well, it seems to be what we're doing today. This seems to be the normal. Point of order. That? I think this should be discussion of fourth reading, not. Yeah, uh, sorry. Okay. Just okay. to be okay. fair, when we're receiving public hearing okay. minutes, it's oh, important wait. that we not get into deliberating and debating okay. the matter. Fair yeah. enough. So it's just for receipt, but definitely okay. save those thoughts yep. for when it comes forward for, for the uh, adoption. Thank you. Yeah. Any further discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor? <laughs> Any opposed? None opposed, motion carries. <laughs> Mr. Roberts. Uh, under agenda item 13, bylaws, B1, um, uh, the recommendation that CVRD bylaw number 4444, uh, uh, Sentinel Ridge Sewer System Service Amendment, that's a boundary extension, bylaw 2022 be adopted. And this is for all directors, moved by Director Segal, seconded by Director Morrison. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. Uh, agenda item 14 is bylaws for electoral area directors only consideration, DEA1. Uh, the recommendation is that CBRD bylaw number 4471, electoral area D, Shawnigan Lake zoning amendment bylaw number, bylaw suites amendment 2023 be granted first and second readings. Moved by Director Acton, seconded by Director Segal. All those in favor? Any opposed? Unopposed, motion carries. And BEA2, uh, the recommendation that CVRD bylaw number 4447, South Couch and Zoning Amendment bylaw 273 for Barry Road 2022 be granted third reading. Moved by Director Martman, seconded by Director Segal. Question. Is, is this one a question? Is this one I can question? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I believe this, sorry, I, I believe this would be the appropriate time. Certainly. Just unusual, so we're so used to, the, by the gets to this stage, the questions have been asked and answered, but please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. and I think it has to do with, sorry, I want to speak to comments that I read um, in the public hearing and maybe give them some uh, support around the limits or the distances that we place on setbacks for cannabis um, um, stores. And I think they, this fee has come out that it's 300 meters is what they would recommend from school, from schools. And when I first came on as director three years ago, yes. we, we wrestled with this and I, I didn't know which way to vote because I thought, um, I heard one comment from a director, well, this seems to be the normal. This seems to be what we have um, to, to deal with, with cannabis became illegal. But the reading I've been doing recently is about children and about development. And one of the things that's really clear to me is that what's the environment that we want to set up for our children? That's right. Yeah. Um, you can't introduce new information after a public hearing. So if you're referring to literature that you've read ah. that's not subject to discussion at the public hearing, I think it, it may cause issues. Okay. Um, because then you're introducing new information to your colleagues about a bylaw. Um, if you wish to have further discussion on it, you would probably have to refer this back and go through the public hearing process again if you want to further discuss with introduction of new information to your colleagues. Thank, so you, for, thank you for that direction. Yeah. I, I think I can do it without adding new information into the colleagues. Okay, and then yeah. if you do want to look at yeah. the policy in the future, that yeah. would, could be a separate discussion outside of this, Fair enough. Yeah. this application. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it has to do with, with my angst from before, and, and this isn't something new. This is something that we've wrestled with at this board um, in terms of, not wrestled, but we've discussed about, you know, where do we put boundaries on cannabis stores? And I think one of the things that I wrestle with is the direction from VHA and the statement that they have put forward is that it's a 300-meter setback. And I think that the key to me is, um, you know, where – where do you rest your decision making on? And I think where I'm going with this is I'm leaning towards VHA, and I think it's um, I'm looking towards their expertise because I don't have the expertise in this. Um, and so I think that's where I would 
look at, um, you know, just challenging the, the thinking about how we look at these things going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, and uh, as was mentioned, and Mr. Robbins said in, uh, next to me, uh, definitely a good policy discussion to look at the overall policy around cannabis uh, dispensaries for the region. Um, I'll just, you know, for that discussion, I'll save it for then. Um, but there are some communities where they're quite urban and compact that 300 meters would exclude them just because of the layout of their community, which is what we face in Ladysmith, right? So, um, but definitely a good conversation to have around furthering cannabis policy. Um, so I'm going to go back to uh, the item that's in front of us in terms of the third reading. Uh, has that been moved and seconded? No. Nope. So do we have a mover and seconder. Moved by Director Nicholson, seconded by Director McClinton. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. Uh, moving on to BEA 3, Mr. Robbins. And the recommendation that CVRD bylaw number 4275, official community plan for the electoral areas amendment bylaw PID 025580-311-2022 be granted third reading. Moved by Director Nicholson, seconded by Director McClinton. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed, motion carries. Mr. Robbins. BEA 4, and the recommendation that CVRD bylaw number 4276, South Couch and Zoning Amendment bylaw PID 025580311-2022 be granted third reading. Moved by Director Wilson, seconded by Director Seagal. Which one are BEA be 4. BEA 4. Any further discussion? Any, any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. I believe that takes us to unfinished business. That is correct. Uh, and that has to do with um, the call from the ABICC for uh, potential resolutions. And your CAO has a bit of a presentation for you with regards to potential resolutions. So, Mr. Chair, <laughs> you'll recall that um, this was referred uh, to the board, actually it was referred to committee and, and then it was um, moved to the board uh, earlier today, um, but this was discussed at the Electoral Area Services Committee um, and in response to the AVICC's request uh, for uh, the board to consider submitting uh, resolutions to the convention uh, coming up uh, later this year. And the deadline for submission is February 9th, so that's why it's here in front of you today. So staff received direction to go away and draft based on the discussion. So what I'll do here, there was two themes. One was regarding public safety and pertaining to speed limits in rural areas. And the second was pertaining to, uh, as I recall, uh, state of infrastructure. And there was a theme about um, economic investments that the province was making. So just one quick stop, Ms. Miles Wilson. Mm -hmm. um, we do have one director at home, and it's not being shared via oh. WebEx. So people at home, including Director Toporowski, can't see it. Okay. So and Ms. Director, I'm so sorry that I, I, I if, yeah. if you've raised your hand and I've missed you, I've been really bad at looking at my screen today. Yeah, I'm just going to share it, just one sec, and okay. I, uh, okay, now it should awesome. be there. Yeah, there we go. Good? Yep. Okay, luckily we hadn't started to read it. Okay, so if it's okay, Mr. Chair, I'm just going to uh, read it uh, aloud, the first one, and then we can have some discussion. And I'm just looking to live edit this because we, uh, we need to, if you'd like to submit it, we have to do it by that deadline I referred to. So resolution number one, or potential resolution number one, is whereas rural community roads are managed by the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure who oversee the maintenance, service, and safety standards, including the setting and adjustment of speed limits, and whereas rural areas are experiencing traffic management issues, including increasing speeding as development and populations increase in areas shared by vehicles, cyclists, and pedestrians, this requires a greater attention to community public safety concerns and necessary improvements. Therefore, it be resolved that the AVICC 
and UBCM request that the Ministry of Transportation review rural speed limits in developing residential areas and commercial or village centres and direct design improvements to make highways safer in these environments, including speed limit reduction. And that was the key theme of the discussion was concerns really about speed. So uh, these drafts were shared with staff and, and feedback was, was incorporated into this, not uh, particularly the comments about the fact that it's not necessarily just in residential areas, but also in commercial village centres where there's, we're seeing congestion and speed issues. So with that, um, any feedback on these, any changes you would like? Uh, I have Director Acton, Director McClinton, but Director Acton to start. Thank you. I think this looks really Sorry. good because um, if 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 we so what I've learned through the community, they'll say, "Oh, uh, you know, we should have speed bumps," and ministry just says, "No, we don't do speed bumps." So this doesn't actually give the solution. It's just saying this is our problem and you need to fix it. So I think it's pretty clear and and it does state the the real issue of like. Uh, speed limits in rural areas and yeah I think it's really good thank you and uh, let's all pray that we don't get a no the warm reception I received outside tells me you probably will but let's try <laughs> director McClinton I think uh, through the chair I think my question was kind of already answered I mean is that because they don't handle things like traffic calming and speed bumps and sidewalks that's just kind of outside the scope where it's focused on speed which I think makes sense but director Morrison could probably speak to it better but it's more it's against the, the, this warranting system that was referred to in their presentation I'm not sure I've ever seen a warrant be approved based on the studies they do you know they'll always and uh, yeah this might be a different discussion but based on our, our discussion today um, they have a study based system that takes a long time to complete the studies and I don't think I've ever seen a study um, agree with what the outlook of communities is and um, yeah I was the chair. microphone through the chair just that if, if that indeed was the thinking with the resolution yeah Ms. Smith. Uh, through the chair um, so the the theme of the discussion that was had at EASC was really related to speed uh, but uh, staff did mention uh, in the notes I received back that in areas like in Couch and Bay, for instance, there was a speed reduction initiative, but also speed boards were installed. So, um, I mean, the ministry would definitely be reviewing it, and I think they alluded to that earlier today. Uh, it's not a, um, a guarantee that it's going to happen. They would have staff reviewing that, but um, there's different calming measures that they could take, but the primary issue that you would like them to address, however they deem, um, would be speed. Thank you. Any other questions, Director Morrison, comments? Well, just further to this and, and being intimately involved in both the EVICC and UBCM process, this is to get to the political masters to tell them uh, residents across the province are concerned about speeding in their rural hamlets and, and small communities, and, and it's that top-down direction to staff to fix it. So uh, us going up through the folks that were here today and, and their traffic engineers and the likes, we're going to continue to get no's. This is an attempt to go through the front door into the ledge, get them to uh, hear what we're saying and perhaps direct it downstream as opposed to us going uphill. Yeah, because they're, they're, the staff that come before us are just following the prescriptions that are given to them by regulation and, juris and uh, legislation. So this is going to the ministers to say change that so that they can actually accommodate our community's needs. Um, so do you want a motion if the board is supportive of advancing this resolution? Is there any changes that board members would want to see to the resolution? Not seeing any, so a motion to forward this resolution moved by Director Morrison, seconded by Director Wilson. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed? Move to the next one. And just as an um, addition to that, there is a backgrounder required for, uh, to accompany the resolutions. So if any of the directors have any further details and information, we would be crafting a page or page and a half that would go along with it. So if you have any specific observations, experiences, concerns, feel free to send them to me and then we, we're going to be crafting this for submission on time. Thank you. And number two, 
Number two. So this one was a little trickier, to be honest, and so the the conversation um, was uh, 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 was really around the state of the infrastructure, and um, I believe Dr. Morrison had made some comments in EASC about uh, the fact that the province was making infrastructure or economic related investments, and is there a way that uh, road improvements could be tied to that related to increased traffic that those might create? So I'll read the resolution and then and uh, leave it uh, open for discussion. So. Whereas rural community roads are managed by the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure who oversee the maintenance service and safety standards and there is continued concern regarding the state of roads in rural communities including poor road surface and drainage, whereas the province, provincial government periodically makes economic investment announcement and is understood that the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure may require assessment of impacts to transportation infrastructure resulting from proposed development and which may direct improvements to transportation infrastructure resulting from proposed development. Therefore, it be resolved that AVICC and the UBCM request that the province direct enhanced investment into rural road network improvements in areas where provincial economic investments are made and where such investments continue to increase development and population. That's a wordy one, but it's yeah, solid. It is very I was wordy. like, wait, oh no, that you answered it with the next lo long part of the sentence, but it's a good one. I uh, got hands up. Sorry, I saw Director Martin and Director Morrison. So I'm just wondering about the value of the adding and where such, the last part of that sentence. Does that leave them a wiggle room by adding that piece in? Uh, through, so, the, through the chair, uh, I suppose uh, we can fine tune that um, what we, to say where we have, where it's observed that. Oh, where provincial economic investments are made that inc continue to increase, like just replace, and where such with that are made and. Sorry, I, I lost it on the screen. So. Sorry. Provincial economic investments are made that continue to increase development and population. Yeah, it just ended at made. I think Mr. Director Marmon's comment was solid because, it, and where they could, in their estimation, they could say we don't believe it does make enough of an impact to justify any further investment. So. This is about where they do a grant for a big project that increases traffic on your rural roads, but they don't give you the commensurate investment in the roads to accommodate the traffic. Kinsel Trestle, anyone? Yeah. That kind of thing, right? So you got pressure in your community because of a wonderful investment, but then there's no investment from the ministry around the roads that service this wonderful economic development for the, for the region, and it's become a thorn in the side of your community since day one, right? Uh, Go ahead. A, a comment just through the chair, just looking at the notes that staff provided that actually out in um, using the roads and out in the communities and the real, the, the main concern from their perspective is definitely the quality of the road surface just degrading um, to a very poor state and also the drainage issues as we've mentioned in there, um, which is just across the board. Um, so. Uh, this is more of an effort, uh, effort, I suppose, maybe to draw attention to the fact that increased traffic is, is only going to worsen the state of already uh, poor road surfaces. Thank you. Director Morrison? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think this is, is touched on the intent perfectly in your comments, Mr. Chair, about the, those investments. That's really what this was meant to tag onto the, the Premier, our new Premier has been announcing uh, investments in it, not only infrastructure but, but manufacturing and the likes in rural communities and I think it, it makes more makes a lot of sense to say wait a minute if you're going to be in increasing manufacturing or, or processing or industrial activities and increasing traffic on our roads there should be that commensurate investment in, in the rehabilitation and maintenance of, of those roads so 
Uh, with that, I, I'm prepared to move this, giving the latitude to staff to make whatever tweaks are needed and, and that they be submitted to AVICC. Do I have a seconder? Seconded by Director Martman. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. Is that the last one? Thank you, Ms. Miles Wilson. Thank you to the staff that contributed to that. Those are great resolutions. Patrick's geeking out over here. He's really excited <laughs> about that. He's like, those are some pretty gold star resolutions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is he patting himself? Oh, here we go. <laughs> All right, over to you, Mr. Robbins. I had nothing to do with them, but they are gold star, gold star resolutions. If gold he star. was the committee, they'd be submitted for debate. AVICC yeah. will recognize that, and certainly UBCM. Gold star. Uh, moving on with your agenda, um, no notice of motions, no new business, Me brings you to uh, question period. Good afternoon and evening, almost. Still light out. Mr. Evans, welcome to the podium. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I noticed that that uh, light didn't go on when the Department of Transport was here. He was just under the wire, actually. <laughs> well, it didn't go on during his presentation, but he was close. Um, um, Mr. Chair, uh, during the ESC meeting, on, on this uh, property up at Erie, I asked a question and, of, of the chair, and they said they would have an answer for me, but I never did get that answer. And the answer was, or, or the question was, what is the increase in water consumption going to be if you convert all four properties into one property and make it commercial tourism? Do we have that answer? Uh, I believe uh, staff was asked to, to find the... So now it's my turn to say, Mr. Evans, I'm sorry I can't answer that, but I will find out and provide the best answer I can at our next board meeting. Because there is a very, very serious water shortage up there. And um, if the directors haven't read the original report, there is a, a hydrology report. If they haven't read that, uh, perhaps they could go back, or I could make it a question. Could they go back and uh, have a look at the hydrology plan plans before uh, we jump in the fire with this one? Thank you. And so this was item nine earlier in the agenda, wasn't it? Was it not? Yes. And so this is going to public hearing. So, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I think all the directors will, can take that under advisement and take the opportunity to read that in advance of the public hearing so it's not new information post-public hearing um, and the opportunity to be there to ask those questions at the hearing as well. Yeah, and... Uh, or posit those statements an, at the public hearing. Another question was, how about the amenities? Are they going to be paid out? Because it seems that these contractors... Uh, get uh, the land rezoned and then they flip the property thank so. you yeah uh, i can't answer the question i think you understand that i can't because um, i'm not familiar with this application until it was on our board agenda today but i will endeavor to get whatever um, answers i can for you without corrupting the public hearing process under legislation but we'll make sure that one way or another we the, the members of the of the eas that will be reviewing that public hearing material um, or hearing you and if I can whatever answers I can provide I will yeah. the other one mr. chair is the people from Shawnee and Lake were wondering about the uh, rail to trail and if if what ICF will be doing and if you've made any alternate plans at all and is there is what's the plan with the 500,000 we have sitting here in reserve for the ICF? If it goes well, I can give you a present state answer because that's a factual answer. The money that's held in reserve for the island corridor at the CVRD is still presently held in reserve and it will stay that way until the board has a discussion and moves forward with it. I can't cross swords here as my role of chair of the island corridor or co-chair of the island corridor foundation. Um, so uh, I can only tell you that we're having ongoing discussions with the federal and provincial governments and all of the stakeholders, including First Nations, industry groups, and we should hear some uh, announcements not too far down the future about the future of the island corridor one way or another. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. 
Any others for question period? Any online for question period, Mr. Robbins? None online. Thank you. So I'd ask for a motion to go into closed session. Uh, moved by Director Segal, seconded by Director Morrison. Under the sections listed in the agenda, sorry, Mr. Robbins, I don't know if you want to read those out. No, I just the, there's a... Sections 91A, G, and C. NC. All right, that's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. We'll take a recess for about five minutes.